God became as we are, that we may be as he is. That is God's purpose. That is his plan which he set forth in Christ for the fullness of time. But God himself never left us. And therefore God cannot return. I am with you always to the end of the age. Therefore God has never left humanity. And therefore he cannot return. And yet, in the promise of the Holy Spirit, the coming of a definite divine person is promised. Scoffers will come in the last day scoffing and saying, Where is the promise of his coming, of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. So a definite person is promised. Now this is my theme tonight. God and man are permanently made one in the person of Christ. God became as I am, but without Christ revealing it, I would not know it. God became as every child born of woman, and yet that child could go through the ages and never know that God became him. And the purpose is that he may become God. He will not in eternity know it unless he knows it in the person of Christ. Now this is what I mean. I'll take now the first book of the New Testament, the book of Galatians, not in its canonical order, but in its chronological order. It was the first book written, either that or First Thessalonians, but it's a toss-up within a year or two. And this is Paul's Really, biography, his confession. He said, I will have you know, brethren, that the gospel which I have preached is not according to man's gospel, for I did not receive it from a man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He was not speculating, trying to set up some workable philosophy of life. This is something that came through revelation. Revealed truth is that which you cannot logically prove. It's something that is entirely different. It is real as this room, more so, but it's something that reason cannot put its teeth into it. Now this is my theme. You mean God became me, and through the centuries I have walked, and God within me, and never left me, not for one moment, not even in my dreams at night. He is the dreamer in me, and the waker and the dreamer are one. And here he never left me, not for one moment. And I didn't know it until Christ came. But Christ comes to us individually, not collectively. He comes to the individual and reveals to the individual who that individual is. If you study the scriptures, for when it came to me, I certainly was the most startled person in the world. I was awed. I could hardly believe that the man that I know so well, that did many things of which I am ashamed, and possibly today I'm capable of doing similar things. And still, in spite of that, he came to me. And revealed to me the being that I really am. Well, who is this Christ? As Paul said, he did not receive it from a man, 
he was not taught it by a man. Well, I make the same confession. I did not hear it from a man. I was not taught it by a man. It came through revelation. I had never known for one moment anything about this revelation until the night that it happened. Oh yes, I had heard of Christ. My mother taught me Christ. In school, I was taught the story of Christ. But then, I went out into the world, I saw pictures on the wall, and they told me this is the artist's concept of Christ, painted under inspiration. And here they are, 40 or 50 different pictures of Christ. No two looking alike, each claiming that it was inspired by the original being. And no two are alike. That is not Christ. What the churches teach concerning Christ is not Christ. The Christ of Scripture is David. That is the Christ. There is no physical description of Jesus in Scripture. There is a physical description of David in Scripture. And when he comes, you know him instantly. There is no uncertainty as to who you're looking at. And no uncertainty as to the relationship between you and the one that you're observing. And then you go back, stunned the next day, and you search your scriptures to find that it was always there. But he is the anointed one. He is the Christed one. He is the chosen one. Rise and anoint him. This is he. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily from that day forward. And so I have found David, and with my holy oil I have anointed him. And David then cried unto me, Thou art my father. As I told him in the beginning, he was my son. Here is the relationship. Well, you would not know in eternity that God became you, actually became you, and that you are permanently made one, but you will not know it, save with the coming of the person, Christ. Not some immensity, not some enormous glow of light that would not convince you that you are God. It could not convince you that you are the Father of the Son of God. All the power in the world could not convince you that you are the Father of the Son of God. The Son has to appear. And when he appears at that moment, in the twinkle of an eye, you know. And you're exactly who you are. And all the darkness is gone, and now you know, and you walk in the light. Walk telling it to those who will hear it. And giving reason to everyone who asks you for a reason. For the hope that is in you. For it is now supported by scripture. Prior to that, you didn't find it and you are not encouraged to find it. For no minister that I ever heard, no true teacher that I have ever heard, has ever voiced it. I never found it in a book that I have ever read. It was in the Bible, but I didn't see it. <clears throat> but all the other books that I read, in my hungry search for the truth, did not even breathe it. When I first came to this city, back in 1945, the lady who met me at the airport and brought me over to the hotel, and she possibly uh, didn't quite notice the time. So when I came to the meeting, I was about almost at the time to start talking. <clears throat> but the head of the organization called me aside into his private office. And he said to me, I've heard some very distressing things about you. I said, like what? He said, I have heard that you do not treat the Bible as secular history. I said, no, I do not. I had not yet received the vision of the Son of God. But I knew the Bible could be interpreted psychologically, for I had proven it day in and day out, not only to my own satisfaction, 
But those who heard and believed what I told them, they too changed their lives based upon my interpretation of Scripture. <clears throat> so he said to me, from my platform you cannot say anything that I heard that you were saying up in San Francisco. I thanked him. As I will abide by your decision tonight. I am your guest tonight. I was addressing his alumni. And there were about, I would say, 500 present all graduates of his institution. And so I spoke to the crowds who were there. But I told him after the meeting, I did what you asked me to do as of tonight. I was your guest to address those that you graduated as teachers. But beginning tomorrow night, I am on my own. Whether I speak in this place or that place or any place. And then he said to me, well, you're not going to give your Bible class Outside of here, I said, no, I came to give everything under your auspices. It was my agreement, a verbal agreement between gentlemen. If you want to break it, it's perfectly all right with me. He said, no. I said, where is the room where I'm going to speak? He said, that room there. I said, well, that room seats about 40 people, doesn't it? He said, yes, that's big enough. He said, you're charging $40 for five talks. And I am the head of the institution. I don't charge more than 25 for my talks. I said, but we are different people. I am teaching the Bible as I know it, not as others taught me to believe it. And I am not going to speak in this place that seats 40 people. I came 3,000 miles under my own steam. And I brought my wife and I brought my daughter and I brought my niece at my own expense. And I do not live in a hovel. I am living in an excellent hotel, paying my own way. As I paid my own way out, I pay my own way back. But I'm not speaking here. So he said to me, if you don't speak here, you can't speak for me at any place. That's perfectly all right. So I said to the lady who met me, one of his students, go out and rent me a place. I promised that man I'll give him 40% of every penny that comes in. And I will take 60. I pay my own first expenses and he simply furnishes the hall. That's all. And for that he gets 40. But I'm charging $40 for my five talks to be given in one week, Monday through Friday. So, she went out and rented a place. She only paid, I think, $90 for the five nights. And 208 attended that class. She said to me, what must I do with the money? I said, throw it in the ash can. Give me 60% of that money and that's all that I want. And I don't care what you do with it. He did nothing for me. He tried to rub me out. He tried to stop me at the very door. And so you can take the money, 40%, which is a considerable sum of money. You don't have to be a great genius to multiply 208 by 40 and then take off 40%. And her investment was, what, $90. So she kept it. And he went through the ceiling. He wanted it. And he did everything to stop me from doing it. And now you want it. No, we have had our day together. And that's it. And so, from then on, I started coming on my own. And not under the auspices of anyone else. Just a gentleman's agreement between Fred and myself for the few years I was with Fred. And that's the story here. Paul did the same thing. And Paul made the confession. What he is talking about, he did not get it from a man. He did not hear it. He wasn't taught it. And it came through a revelation. And the revelation was the true meaning of Jesus Christ. And then he understood who Christ really was. For he knew his scriptures. And the only scriptures that Paul read was the scripture of the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. For he hadn't started to write. And his book, Galatians, is the first book of the New Testament. So the only testament he spoke of, or the only scripture, was the Old Testament. And then he read into the Old. And now listen to his words. And when it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. It pleased God to reveal his Son in me. But he tells you first that he who 
set me apart before I was born. Called through his grace. And then it pleased him to reveal his son in me. Before he was born. Paul is not speaking of any physical birth. Before he was born from above. That's what he's saying. The King James Version said, before he separated me from the womb. No, he didn't separate you from that womb. It is birth from above of which he speaks, as we are told in the book of John. Except you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul is speaking of that birth. And before that birth took place in him, he was set apart. The same thing happened in my case. Before I experienced the birth from above, on the 20th day of July in 1959, 30 years before I was set apart and called into the divine council. And when my name was checked off in the register, then taken into the presence of the Ancient of Days, God himself. His infinite love is standing as a person before me. And then he embraced me, our bodies fused, and I know from experience the form of God is a living form, a forming form. And anyone who is fused with it, that actually <coughs> forms it into the image of God. It's the only way that Christ could recognize you as his father. You have actually to be formed into that being. So the embrace, that fusion, because his body is a forming, creative body. As you fuse with it, it starts now forming you into the image of himself. Then comes that one that is born from above. It is that one who encounters God's Son, and God's Son recognizes him now as Father. So though God and man are permanently made one, man will not know it, save through the person Christ. And I say person advisedly. Don't think of him as some impersonal force, he is not some impersonal force. It is a person, and he's a youth, an eternal youth, and his name is David. So when the poet wrote concerning David, taking the book of Samuel as his inspiration to write the poem, <clears throat> he has David speaking now to the king, and telling the king, as he stands before the king, O Saul, a face like my face shall receive thee, and a man like unto me thou shalt love, and be loved by forever. A hand like this hand shall throw open the doors of eternal life to thee. See the Christ stand. He confesses he is the Christ, the anointed, the chosen of God the Father. Saul could not see it. Saul was a demented king. And Saul only symbolizes humanity who has not yet encountered that revelation of the Christ as a person. And he's not anything that you see hanging on the walls that you see all over the place. He is the eternal youth, so beautiful you cannot describe the beauty of David. And so every attempt has been made to put him into form and put him into pictures. You cannot, were I an artist and the thing remained, yes, I can see him in my mind's eye. I can see the love that poured from me to him as I feasted on the beauty of my son. I can see the feet that he accomplished with that severed head of the enemy of Israel lying before me on a table. I can see the entire drama now unfold before me as it did that night on the morning of the 6th of December, 1959. So I tell you the story is true. And I was not taught it. I never heard it. It is not man's gospel. 
It came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here, God actually became you, literally became you. Say, I am, that's the Father. But you do not know he's the Father. And you will not in eternity know that he is the Father and you are the Father. But when you say, I am, you're not pointing on the outside. You can't say, I am, and mean anyone other than yourself. You can say, we are, and include it, but you can't say, I am, and point to anyone outside of yourself. Yet you can say, I am, and still not know that is God the Father. And you will not in eternity know that that is God the Father until the Son appears. And when he appears, the drama is over. The mystery is over. It's all been solved. For he stands before you, and here you look into your son's face, and the whole thing returns, and how God at that moment succeeded in his purpose. He actually gave himself to you. He never left you, and therefore he cannot return. But there is a promise of some divine person coming. And scoffers will come and they will scoff, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? But he comes in a way that no one knows. He comes silently. He comes suddenly, like a thief in the night. So Christ comes to everyone as one unknown. Yet one who in the most ineffable manner Let the individual experience who he is. So when he comes to you, you will experience not only who Christ is, and I tell you he's David, but you'll experience who you are, and I tell you who you are, you are God the Father. You are literally God the Father, <coughs> waiting for the coming of the promise. And when the promise comes, it's the Son coming to reveal you, for he sets the Father free. And if the Son has made you free, you are free indeed. But no other one can set you free. Today man thinks, if I only had a fortune, I would be free from the pressure. Did you read yesterday morning's paper? Well, here is a man, 47 years old. A personal fortune in excess of five billion dollars. Not million. Five billion. Now, he blew his brains out. And they're saying he was under pressure, bringing about a huge merger of many banks in Sweden. And the pressure was so great that he couldn't stand the strain, and so he blew his brains out. Five billion dollars did not stop him from that act. And he had to do it. He came in on cue, and he departs on cue. That was his moment in time when he leaves the stage into another sphere. With five billion, all he could think of would be more billions. How many more billions do you want in the world? He had five billion. Personal fortune. And others will think, but if I only had some money, I would be set free. You're only set free when the sun sets you free. You can drop dead here now as he did yesterday with a bullet in his head and he is no more free than he was one moment before he pulled the trigger he'll find himself in a world just like this and that's why I repeat time and again live so that mind can store a past worthy of recall for the mind whose contents vanish it remains but he suffers loss he will be saved, but only as through fire. So we are passing through the furnaces. And we are moving from one state to the other, thinking now, if I only had more of this, more recognition, more of that. It doesn't work that way. I feel your presence here, and your constant presence here, assures me that you have fulfilled that passage in the book of Amos. In the eighth chapter, I will send a famine upon the land. It will not be a hunger for bread or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God. When a man is so hungry for the word of God that not a thing in this world can satisfy that hunger, but an experience of God, he's on the road. And there's no diversion. 
Let me now wait a little while. As a friend of mine said to me back in 1925 in London, I said, Matt, his name was Matthew. I said, Matt, why don't you become more interested in things of this nature? <clears throat> For his father had introduced me to the light of Asia and the Bhagavad Gita and things of that sort. He said, no, I'm only 21. And when I get old enough, like my father, the father was then 50. When I get an old man like my father, then I become interested, if then. But I want to live first. So I came back to New York City, and he went off to India as a tea taster. A letter came from his mother about six months later after he went to India, saying that Matt died. He caught some kind of a fever, and then in no time flat, Matt was gone. No, tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, he wasn't hungry. He wanted the things of this world. He wanted all the things that, well, he thought young people should have. He wanted the sex world, he wanted money, he wanted position, he wanted honor. All his ambitions realized. But this, no, that can take, take its time. I tell you, if you're so hungry that not a thing can divert you, that not a thing could this night tempt you, to turn from it because the other seems more rosy. Then you're on the road and the hunger is there. Not for these things that they offer, but for the word of God. And what I've told you this night is the word of God, for it did not come to me in any other way, save by revelation. It was revealed to me. And I share it with you just as it came to me. And when I get confirmation in scripture, for that is a witness. The Bible is a witness. Now the internal witness is my own experience. And where two different ones agree in testimony, it is conclusive. So my inward testimony of the Spirit agrees with the outward testimony of the letter. So I went back and I read the story. And here it is staring me in the face in the second psalm. And David tells of the decree of the Lord. And he said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Well, it was always there. And in the 16th chapter of First Samuel, when he's looking for one that he wants to make king, and they bring all these before him, are all these your sons? There are one, one more. There is one more. But he's tending the flock. He said, go and get him. We will not sit until he comes. And as he comes in, the voice speaks to Samuel the prophet. This is he. Rise and anoint him. And then the Spirit of God came mightily upon him from that day forward. And so, I tell you, it's a person. And you will not know, if I am a person, don't give me a donkey as an offspring. I don't beget donkeys or cats or things of that sort. It's a person. I'm a person. And if I'm a father, my son has to be a person. And it is a person. It's not infinite light. And it is an infinite power. Although that is said of the Christ, he is the power of God, and he is the wisdom of God, but the power is personified as that you. And the wisdom is personified. So it's a person. And so when David comes into your world, he reveals you as God the Father. <coughs> and yet while you wear these mortal garments of flesh and blood, you are restricted. Until that moment in time when you take it off for the last time. Then you are one with the risen Lord. But because he is in everyone, where are you going? Is not the kingdom of heaven within? So where do you think you're going to find me? I promise, as I have done before, I reveal myself. I have so far to many. I will continue. And when this thing comes off, they will really be a revelation to those who have heard and who have believed. For I know where I'm going. And yet I'm not going to go away from anyone because I can't get away from the being that I am. And the being that I am is God. Well, if God became all of us, where can I go? That would be outside of you. And so now I am near to you. But when I take this thing off, I will never be so near or rather so far away, as even to be near. Because nearness would imply separation. 
and I can't be separated from you if I am one with God. And God is in you. So God actually became man, that man may become God. So when man discovers who he really is through the revelation of the Son, when he takes off the garment for the last time, where is he but one with the risen Lord? And if the risen Lord is in man, then where is that man going to be? And so I tell you, I'll be not even there. For that would imply that I am still something external. No, you can't see God as you see object in space, but he knows who he is through his son. And there's no other way of knowing him save you know him through the son. And so, you will see me, but you'll see me from within. Listen to the words of Paul. And when it pleased God, to reveal his son in me, the preposition is in, is not to me, as some translations have it. But the actual preposition is in. It pleased God to reveal his son in me. And so that's where you're going to see him. But he will seem to you as something external to yourself. But you, you don't see self, you see yourself in your son. And it's the son who reveals you. So tell the story as it really ought to be told. And let man walk in faith, in hope, that one day he will encounter the Son who reveals him as God the Father. So we are told, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now he said he so loved the world, he gave his only Son. That Son, I tell you, is David. If you read the words, in the red letter edition, there, these uh, passages are all in red letters. And yet they are supposed to be the words of Christ. No, they are spoken of him, not by him. The evangelist is writing of, it's in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. It begins with the 16th verse. So I tell you, it's all about you. The whole book is all about you. It's your biography. As told us in the 40th Psalm. In the volume of the book, it is all about me. I delight to do thy will, O my Lord. Now here are the words put into the mouth of Christ on the cross. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. That's the 31st Psalm. But the completed verse is this. After he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It goes on to state, thou hast redeemed me. O Lord, faithful God. That's the completed verse. And these are the words of David in the 31st Psalm. Therefore, who is uttering them? Who is the Christ? In the 16th Psalm, he now makes the appeal to the Father. Thou wouldst not let my soul remain in hell. So he raises him up. He actually raises him up with in you. May I tell you, it comes like an explosion. You come to the end of the journey. The climax is brought about by an explosion. Not of matter, but of mind. Your whole mind explodes. And as it explodes, you find yourself facing your son. And here is David. And not for one moment is there any uncertainty as to who he is and the relationship. And one second before, you did not know it. I was born from above and did not know it. For the birth from above took place on the 20th day of July of 1959. And this was the 6th day of December, 1959. 139 days later, I discovered it. I didn't know, because I was born from above and thrilled beyond measure that it, ful it fulfilled scripture. The witnesses were there, the child wrapped in swaddling clothes, he was there, everything was there. And yet, I didn't know, outside of the fact, I'm born from above. But I didn't know, David, I didn't know what part he played in the drama to this extent. 
And I didn't know it was he who revealed me as God the Father. But I know today he and he alone will reveal everyone as God the Father. That is David. And when we can find people who can become so prejudiced with a false concept, who can single out a race of people and try to rub them off the face of the earth, when that is the message through which God spoke, that was the message that came to the world. It's an eternal message, and it's true. And so, those who speak of another Christ, they have the false Christ. Jesus is God the Father. Jesse, who is called the father of David, means Jehovah exists. So Jesse is simply the Lord himself. And his son calls him father. And Jesse is any form of the verb to be. In other words, I am. Who is your father? My father is Jesse the Bethlehemite. Your father is Jesse the Bethlehemite. And who are you? The son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now go to your concordances and start looking them up. And you come forward with the conclusion that it's there all along and you didn't see it. That here was your son. And because he was born, so-called born, 3,000 years ago, you turned the pages over. But that's old stuff. It means nothing to me today. It has no bearing on the 20th century. Why, it's forever. It never comes to an end. It's forever and forever. The only way that man could ever be redeemed is not through any other way. There's no other way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. The only true and living way, and there is no other way. And yet, morning, noon, and night, there are all new ways appearing on the surface. A new isms here, a new ism there, all trying to spread something that is a lie. It's not based upon revelation. It's simply people sitting, sitting down, trying to work out some, what they consider, a nice, pleasing philosophy of life. But I tell you, I have experienced it. That I stand here, I did not know until I experienced it. I was just as blind as Paul. Paul went out to destroy everything that claimed what Christianity claims. He consented unto Stephen's death, stoning to death. And in spite of that, he was chosen. In spite of all that he did, he was the one who was elected. He had all that it took. He had the fire. He had that something that would face prisons and face anything rather than turn from the vision. He kept the divine vision in time of travel. And so he stood before King Agrippa. And he said, oh king, why should it be thought strange that I have seen the master, seen the risen Lord, seen the resurrection. Why is it strange that our people should think the resurrection is false? That is all taught in Scripture, but they didn't see it. If I am appealing to God the Father not to leave my soul in the pit, not to leave me in hell, and then I could say a few chapters later, Thou hast redeemed me. Well, then he knows that he has been redeemed, for he saw the Father. And if he saw the Father having died, well, then he must be alive and could say, I am the living way, the true and living way. So you take my word for it. I would not betray you. I would not lead you astray. I take my Bible seriously. And the third chapter of the book of James warns men who would be a teacher that the judgment is harder on him who would be the teacher than on any other person. For you are warned in the third chapter of James to be very careful when you go out to teach. You teach the truth and don't bring in any other thing outside of the truth as revealed. I'm not speaking of mathematics, not speaking of any of these things. I'm speaking of revealed truth in Scripture. And the story is there but it must be repeated in the individual. 
and everything said of him in the scripture will one day be experienced by every one born of woman, but each in his own good time. For as we are told in the third chapter of Second Peter, when they wonder about when is his coming, he said they do not know that a thousand years is as a day in the eyes of God. So they're concerned about when is he coming, and a thousand years is only one day in the eyes of God. And so if you have 6,000 days or years of travel, it's only six days before the image is completed and you and God are permanently made one. And then comes the revelation of the Son who reveals you as God and you know you are permanently one. You are the Father of God's only Son. And there's no other way that you would ever know it. Now let us go into the silence. Now are there any questions please? Yes sir. Uh, Neville, would you get the, the uh, version of the Bible that you recommend and the concordance? Which one? Which verse? I don't know, or the, the, uh, the version. In other words, which, which Oh, well, I take, I have, I have many Bibles at home, and I use mostly the Revised Standard Version. And I use James Strong's Concordance. I find that exhaustive. Every word in the, of course, it's based upon the King James Version, but it's easy to find the parallel in the Revised Standard Version. But that is based, that is the, the uh, concordance, James Strong's concordance, uses the King James Version as its guide. But they take every word in the Hebrew, every word in Greek, and they define the original meaning for you. And you have sometimes a dozen definitions. And you can choose what you feel was the intention of the author. Or you can go along with what they did. But I use the Revised Standard Version. Most of the time. But I have Moffitt's. I had Farrar, Fenton, Lightfoot, the New English Bible. Oh, I have so many Bibles. But I find it daily. I take my Revised Standard Version and read it. Well, oh, if I do not like a translation, I will see what another one did or another one did. And if I don't like any of them, go to my concordance and see what I would have done if I had that opportunity. Now take that statement in uh, Jeremiah. Can a man bear a child? Why then do I see every man with his hands on his loin like a woman in labor? Well, that didn't satisfy me. I went from Bible to Bible. They all almost give the same meaning. So I started a search in the concordance. And the word that they translate loins is not that at all. But they could not bring themselves to believe what the vision is actually stating. Now these are the words of the Lord speak, spoken to his prophet Jeremiah. And he's asking Jeremiah, can a man bear a child? And he doesn't wait for the answer from his prophet. He's answering what? He said, Why then do I see every man with his hands drawing himself out of himself, just like a woman in labor? If you take the concordance and go through it, you'll find that is the best translation of it. I see him with his hands drawing himself out of himself. And that's exactly what happened.